Virtually every cell in every living thing contains chromosomes, which are made of densely packed strands of DNA that function as a blueprint of the individual organism's characteristics. During reproduction, chromosomes from each parent replicate and shuffle their parts to produce new chromosomes. Then, each parent passes chromosomes to offspring. But the process is imperfect. Along the way, DNA is subject to random mutations or mistakes, giving each offspring its own unique blueprint. Sometimes this produces characteristics in offspring that are benign. Other times it produces harmful characteristics, like a misshapen wing. But occasionally, the process gives rise to a beneficial trait. For example, a butterfly whose coloration mimics another species that tastes bad to birds. About a hundred years after Darwin proposed that natural selection acts on new traits appearing in a population, genetics revealed the biological mechanism that gives rise to those traits in the first place. And therefore you could say that when modern genetics came into being, everything in Darwin's theory was at risk, could have been overturned if it turned out that genetics contradicted the essential elements of evolutionary theory. But it didn't contradict them. It confirmed them in great detail. And as Miller would testify, a genetics paper published less than a year before the trial had confirmed what has long been the most inflammatory part of Darwin's theory, the common ancestry of humans and apes. That paper explored a curious discrepancy in our chromosomes. The cells of all great apes, like chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans, contain 24 pairs of chromosomes. If humans share a common ancestor with apes, you'd expect us to have the same number. But surprisingly, human cells contain only 23 pairs. The question is, if evolution is right about this common ancestry idea, where'd the chromosome go? Well. Evolution makes a testable prediction, and that is that somewhere in the human genome, we ought to be able to find a piece of scotch tape holding two chromosomes together, so that our 24 pairs, two of them were pasted together to form just 23. And if we can't find that, then the hypothesis of common ancestry is wrong and evolution is mistaken. Next slide. To solve this riddle for the court, Miller would show how scientists discovered traces of our evolutionary past buried in the very structure of a chromosome carried by all humans. Typically, on the ends of every chromosome, you should find special genetic markers, or sequences of DNA, called telomeres. And in their middles, you should find different genetic markers called centromeres. But if a mutation occurred in the past, causing two pairs of chromosomes to fuse, we should find evidence in those genetic markers, telomeres not only at the ends of the new chromosome, but also at their middles, and not one, but two centromeres. Finding a structure like this in our chromosomes would explain why humans have one pair fewer than the great apes. And if we don't find that, then evolution is in trouble. Next slide. Lo and behold, the answer is in chromosome number two. All of the marks of the fusion of those chromosomes predicted by common descent and evolution, all those marks are present on human chromosome number two. So the case is closed in a most beautiful way. And that is, the prediction of evolution of common ancestry is fulfilled by that lead pipe evidence that you see here in terms of tying everything together that our chromosome, formed by the fusion from our common ancestor, is chromosome number two. Evolution has made a testable prediction, and it has passed. So, modern genetics and molecular biology actually support evolutionary theory? They support it in great detail. And the closer we can get to looking at the details of the human genome, the more powerful that evidence has become. 
Darwin didn't even know about molecular biology and DNA, yet that's where some of the most profound evidence is, is being uncovered today. Think about that. That somebody in the 1800s made predictions that are being confirmed in molecular biology labs today. That's a very profound statement of a very successful theory. Not a single observation, not a single experimental result has ever emerged in 150 years that contradicts the general outlines of the theory of evolution. Any theory that can stand up to 150 years of contentious testing is a pretty darn good theory, and that's what evolution is. And the deep understanding of evolution, as proposed by Darwin, has with genetics unlocked many of the secrets of life. It's an explanatory framework within which all the rest of biology fits. Right? It's something that we use uh, in practical biological applications. Medicine, agriculture, industry. When you're getting a flu vaccine, that really depended upon evolutionary knowledge. In many, many specific ways, evolution makes a practical difference. It's not just something that happened in the past, evolution's happening now. So if evolution has stood up to all this scrutiny, what about intelligent design? Does it play by the same rules? If you invoke a non-natural cause, a spirit force or something like that in your research, I have no way to test it. So supernatural causation is not considered part of science? Yeah. I hesitate to beg the patience of the court with this, but being a Boston Red Sox fan, I can't resist it. Yeah. One might say, for example, that the reason the Boston Red Sox were able to come back from three games down against the New York Yankees was because God was tired of George Steinbrenner and wanted the Red Sox to win. In my part of the country, you'd be surprised how many people think that's a perfectly reasonable explanation for what happened last year. And you know what? It, it could be true. But it certainly wouldn't be science. It, it's not scientific. And it's certainly not something we can test. The fundamental problem with intelligent design is that you can't use it to explain the natural world. It's essentially a negative argument. It says evolution doesn't work, therefore the designer did it. Evolution doesn't work, therefore we win by default. But when you ask them, what does intelligent design tell you about nature? Uh, does it tell you uh, what the designer did? Does it tell you what the designer used to design something with? Does it tell you what purpose the designer had for designing something? Does it tell you when the designer did it? Why the designer did it? It doesn't tell you anything like that. Basically, it's a negative argument, and you can't build a science on a negative argument. After three weeks of testimony on the nature of science, the evidence for evolution, and the failings of intelligent design, the plaintiffs had presented their case. To watch the whole thing, you got an education in what evolution was, where evolution stands as a theory now in the 21st century. If you concentrated, you would get sucked into this thing and the day would go by and you'd come out and you'd think, that was amazing what I heard here. And these eloquent people, you know, with these incredible educations and it was fantastic. The plaintiff's attorneys had put on an amazing case, but there was this idea, especially among those who weren't sitting in the trial every day, that when the defense started, you know, then we'll see some pretty interesting stuff too on the other side. The question now was, could the defense prove that intelligent design is a scientific theory? What evidence could they muster to support this claim? <laughs> 